Tonight, Toronto police are searching for two suspects wanted in a daring robbery inside Vaughn Mills Mall. Drove onto the property of the mall here and smashed their way through the glass entrance. The suspects proceeding to rob an electronic store before smashing their car through another entrance to escape. Plus, we have a dietitian, we have an RN, we have a social worker. Looking at possible solutions to the doctor shortage in the province, such as the use of nurse practitioners and other health professionals to fill the gap. And to support black culture, black artists, black anything, you know, just black excellence. It is Black History Month with events across the city celebrating the artistry and contributions of black Canadians. We'll give you a sneak peek at some of them. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. Police are calling it an audacious crime. And tonight they are continuing to search for two suspects wanted in a daring smash and grab at Vaughn Mills Mall. Dramatic security camera footage captured a car smashing through the mall entrance. The suspects proceeding to rob a store before smashing their way out. Ali Chiasson has this story. It's like a scene from Grand Theft Auto. Vaughn Mills edition and you just unlocked a new level of retail robbery. So at about 1.10 a.m., two suspects in a black Audi drove onto the property of the mall here and smashed their way through the glass entrance to the property. They then proceeded to drive through the mall and made their way to an electronics store where they broke into the store and then proceeded to take a quantity of electronic devices. The suspects then got back into their vehicle, drove through them all again, but this time broke their way through another glass door on the other side of the mall and escaped the mall. Haven't we seen this before? Whether it's ridiculous or, or it's just brazen, um, it's, you know, it's, it's unacceptable to people work in this mall. There's gonna be cleaners, there's gonna be security personnel. And so we're just fortunate that nobody was hurt. Police are looking for two suspects in this smash and dash. The black Audi A4 with Quebec plates has turned up stolen, so they face a litany of charges. There's break and enter, there's mischief to property, there's dangerous driving. If these people are caught, there's the possession of stolen property, uh, including the vehicle and, and, and what have you. The whole heist lasted no longer than 20 minutes before police arrived. The damage and value of stolen goods is being tabulated. As for the car, it was found this afternoon with no suspects in sight. No, just... They were last seen on the store's security camera footage. With their mall joy ride making the rounds on the news, police are hopeful they'll catch the suspects soon. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Thousands of Brampton residents could soon be getting free pouches to help fend off car thieves. Brampton's council committee has unanimously greenlit a proposal by Mayor Patrick Brown that will see the city distrib distribute Faraday bags. Now, they're aimed at preventing robbers from exploiting a radio frequency that comes from key fobs. Here's an example of a Faraday bag, $6. You put your key in it, just like that, and you can't do the relay attack. They can't steal your car. The proposal comes at a time when auto thefts are on the rise in Brampton and much of the GTA. New numbers from Peel Police show a 92% rise in car thefts last year compared to 2019. A man is now facing charges after a baby was found with critical injuries at a hotel in Markham. The two-month-old was rushed to hospital from the Monte Carlo Inn just after 2 p.m. on Tuesday. A man was taken into custody at the scene. Investigators with York Police now say a 61-year-old man from China has been charged with attempted murder in the case. They say the man is a family member of the baby. Police say they won't be releasing his name in order to protect the identity of the baby as well as witnesses. And police have released new image tonight of a suspect wanted in connection with an assault in the city's east end. The victim of the attack died in hospital yesterday, a week after the incident on Danforth Avenue near Jones Avenue. Now, this is the man police are searching for. He's believed to be about six feet tall and in his 20s. Police had earlier released another image of the man who was carrying a white and blue plastic bag. Now, the victim 
is former CBC radio employee Michael Finley. He died yesterday following complications resulting from the January 24th assault. In a message to staff today, the CBC's Executive Director of News Gathering and Operations, Kathy Perry, said Michael will be remembered as an exceptional storyteller, documentary maker and editor. Now, last night, we told you about the shortage of family doctors in this province. Tonight, we're looking into possible solutions to that problem. Now, one idea involves other health professionals taking some of the workload off the existing crop of family doctors. Senior reporter Michael Crawley has the story. Okay, deep breath in and out. Marak Fazel is not a family doctor, but she can do just about everything that a family doctor can. Great blood pressure. She's a nurse practitioner. Nurse practitioners can diagnose, uh, we can prescribe, we can send you to a specialist if necessary. At this clinic in the northwest corner of Toronto, nurse practitioners lead a team of healthcare professionals caring for hundreds of patients like Andrew Lawrence. And I've been getting great treatment from Zarna, very thorough, very detailed and uh, yeah, I feel looked after. We have a dietitian, we have an RN, we have a social worker. And the idea, of course, with team-based care is to be able to wrap around services for individuals that are in need. There are 26 nurse practitioner-led clinics around the province. And this just shows me your oxygen levels and your heart rate, okay? To cope with the shortage of family doctors, Danae Peart believes there should be more. We're in an aging society, and in this aging society, doctors will retire. <laughs> um, and we're not able to replenish um, doctors fast enough to respond to the needs in the sector. Across the city, that push to entice new doctors to practice family medicine is intense. So we have found over the past one to two years, it has been extremely difficult to recruit new doctors to join our clinic. It used to be common for medical school graduates to train here as family medicine residents. And that's been a pipeline for us to have new doctors come in and join and allow the practice to grow. Um, in the past couple of years, that's completely dried up. Across Ontario, the proportion of med school grads choosing family medicine is dwindling. So we have no new residents who are interested in coming. You know, we've had advertisements and sort of used all of our different tools that we use to try and recruit new doctors and have found it really, really difficult and basically impossible at this point. How to make family practice more attractive to med school grads? One idea is to team them up with other health professionals. So we know doctors are stronger when they work in teams. They can have uh, a psychotherapist on their team, uh, even a pharmacist on their team, a nurse practitioner, a physician extender uh, of some sort of physician assistant. And so putting family doctors inside teams to support them will help retain and recruit more doctors. I believe that we will, as we get wiser in the sector, realize that having multiple professionals, multiple disciplines in the same space looking out for patient care, we will realize that it's actually the best way. Mike Crowley, CBC News, Toronto. Meteorologist Colette Kennedy joins us now with a first check on the forecast. And Colette, uh, so nice to see some of that sun out again today. Kind of makes that cold a little bit more bearable. Yeah, it just makes it a bit easier to tolerate, doesn't it? And, you know, speaking of the cold, we've been talking about how there's some even colder air coming for the end of the week. But there are some ups and downs here, and it doesn't last forever. So just kind of showing you the daytime highs, you can see how close that much colder air is here in northwest Ontario and into the prairies. But the daytime high on Thursday in Toronto, minus one. Then we move forward in time, and here it is. So this is the daytime high, not the low, minus 15 on Friday. But by Saturday, minus four, okay, you can see those green contours starting to push back and have a look at Sunday above seasonal, three degrees. System moving in means it may be a mix of rain and snow uh, in terms of what we'll see with precipitation, but still, that's what's happening. So overnight tonight, mostly clear skies. We will have that cold front approaching us though. So the winds are gonna kick up tomorrow ahead of it. We'll see increasing cloudiness and then a dusting, flurries to a dusting coming through late tomorrow into tomorrow evening. Elsewhere with some lake effects, some snow squalls setting up and that'll be more significant snowfall. But tonight, a cool one, cold, minus 10, feeling like minus 18. But there it is with that daytime high tomorrow with the breezy conditions. Thanks so much, Colette. You could soon spend less time waiting in line for a new driver's license, license plate, or even a marriage license. Service Ontario is making more services available online. Premier Doug Ford spoke about the changes at a Service Ontario location in Brampton. 
In the coming months, Service Ontario will be introducing a number of new pilot programs. For example, soon to be married couples will be able to skip a visit to City Hall and participating municipalities and apply for a marriage license online. These changes are in addition to the 55 services that have already moved online, such as health card renewals. Ford also announced enhancements to the appointment booking system. People will now be allowed to book multiple appointments at once at any of Service Ontario's 272 locations. Mayor John Tory has formally presented his budget to city councillors. The $16 billion spending package remains largely unchanged despite weeks of meetings and public deputations. And as municipal affairs reporter Sean Jeffords tells us, some city councillors say the mayor has shut them and the public out of the process. Mayor John Tory made it official today. His proposed budget will move ahead largely as planned. The 5.5% property tax increase, the 1.5% hike in the city building levy, and the controversial $48 million increase to the police budget all remain. We have worked hard to keep any increases to taxes or fees as low as possible to help address the affordability challenges that our residents continue to face. Tory says that after weeks of public meetings and hearing hundreds of people express their views about the budget, he stands behind his plan. He says he'll fight any attempt to change the police budget. I went and listened. I believe the vast majority of Torontonians support the need for us to improve response times, to have more neighborhood officers, to have 911 answered faster, uh, to have uh, missing persons looked after in a more uh, diligent way. And uh, so I'm saying that I listened. We had a process, but I stood firm on what I recommended. Under the new strong mayor system, Tory now writes the city budget, and the deadline to present it to council was today. That system also means councillors now need a two-thirds majority vote to change his plan. Because of that, Councillor Chris Moyes says he and fellow councillors may not be able to do much to alter the spending plan. Well, the budget uh, is a done deal, right? You know, the mayor presented the budget to, will present the budget to council, and uh, so really um, there isn't much change to it. Councillor Gord Perks says the new budget process under the strong mayor system has cut out the public. This is pretty much identical to the budget that we've had all along. Uh, over 300 people came and said they had problems, 300 Torontonians said they had problems with the budget, but the mayor hasn't listened. Tory says that $6 million has been found since budget launch and that council can divert that to needed projects. But Councillor Josh Matlow calls that a ploy designed to divide council. It, it's, it's a cute strategy, uh, but it's disingenuous because frankly, um, you know, what the mayor is doing with the rest of the budget is affecting everything that we all care about. Councillors will be able to make one final attempt at changing the budget. The spending plan will come before council for one final debate on February 14th. Sean Jefford, CBC News, Toronto. Welcome back. It is Black History Month and across the city events are taking place all through February, giving people a chance to learn about and celebrate the many contributions of black Canadians. Patrick Swadden got a peek at some of the events going on. Music in the air, an ambience of celebration. And why not? Today marks the beginning of Black History Month and the city is gearing up. Starting in our very own studios with an event celebrating being black in Canada. Kiosha Love delivers an impassioned poem about black women. I pray for a new world, a new home that includes black women and their existence. Today I give thanks to black women and pray for every black, black girl's life. While across the town at Stacked Market, artist Josh High is showcasing his work celebrating black excellence. You know, it's, it's a very... Um, an honorable feeling and uh, experience to be representing the black culture in a very positive and creative way. It's a great opportunity to just support my my background, you know, to support black culture, black artists, black anything, you know. Also at Stacked, Omar Martin has gathered an incredible lineup of musicians. <laughs> It's an upbeat start to the month, and Torontonians have the opportunity to attend events all throughout February. I think that it's going to be an amazing opportunity for people to come out and be together as a community. Umberine Anayat is excited for all the opportunities people have to learn about Black Canadian contributions. Toronto first proclaimed Black History Month in 1979. 
what's really exciting is, you know, we are the first Canadian mun municipality to honor and officially um, announce Black History Month. She's organizing the programming for Toronto History Museums, including Dismantle, an art exhibit inspired by the efforts of black abolitionists. It features Louisa Pipkin, a freedom seeker who escaped enslavement in the U.S. and came to Canada. There's also Kumba at Harbour Front Centre, a festival featuring music and dance performances, as well as workshops and literary events from the Afro diaspora in Canada. Kumba is not just for the black community. We want all communities to come and be exposed to the programming that we have. All month, something for everyone to celebrate black Canadians. Whatever artistic um, aspect you're interested in, music, film, art, culture, uh, experiential workshops, there it's all there this year. Patrick Swadden, CBC News, Toronto. And we want to introduce you now to a retired teacher who blazed a trail for black educators in the province. Her name is Millie Burgess and she is 99 years old. She was born in Bermuda and was the first female teacher of African descent to teach in the Ontario school system. Tally Ricci sat down with Millie to learn more about her incredible career. Some of them were so exciting to teach. You know, they, they were anxious to learn more. Even at 99 years old, it's clear the memories and the pride Millie Burgess has for her career hasn't waned. I'll meet people for the first time and they would say, oh, how many children do you have? And I said, 20, and they're just about dropped. <laughs> they couldn't believe, 20, what are you talking about? I said, oh, I'm a teacher. Burgess's teaching career in Toronto spanned 35 years. She's believed to be among the first black teachers in Canada, landing her first job in the late 50s. Toronto didn't have that many black people. At first, it was kind of, it was kind of scary, but, I, you know, I got over that. She says at that time, many of the children were European immigrants, which meant she was also tasked with teaching them how to speak English. Each weekend, I would spend about, I would say three hours, four hours I used to spend setting up my, my schedule for the week. And my husband would say, let's go to the movies. And I said, I can't go, I've got to get this done for this. And he said, you only work five days a week, <laughs> not seven. But despite that passion and dedication she had for the job, she still experienced moments like this. And he said, I'm, I'm here to talk to the teacher. Where is the teacher? So I said, I am the teacher. He said, you, you are the teacher? He went to the office and he said to the principal, do you have any persons in your grade one classroom that's white? Because I don't want my child to be taught by a black teacher. Burgess is now celebrated by other black educators for opening doors for others, including members of her own family. She's sort of like 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 the the, the leader, the, the trailblazer for the family. So my mother and two of my aunties were like the first black teachers in in Toronto, Toronto Board of Education. So that's kind of a cool, a cool legacy. And she knew that if she had a black child in her class, she was modeling for that black child that this was a profession that they for sure could consider following. And it was also teaching everyone that if you just see us and learn from us, be with us, you'll see that we're all really just the same. When asked what advice she'd give to young people deciding on a career, the award-winning teacher repeated what her mother always told her. Go to school and learn as much education that you can. Take in everything you can. Her legacy is sure to continue well beyond her years in the classroom. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Let's go back to Colette now for a look at your extended forecast. And Colette, temperature is getting a bit of a bump tomorrow, but then a big dip. Yeah, it is going to be significantly colder. I know it was kind of cold uh, today and certainly tonight will be, but I mean even colder still as we go into Thursday night, Friday and Friday night. But it's kind of that, like 36 hour window, 36 to 48, uh, the most that it lasts. But that's the trade off. You know, we had some sun, but then we get the colder conditions. But we will be seeing those temperatures bumping up a bit tomorrow. The daytime high close to freezing, but with breezy conditions, it's uh, tricky. So it doesn't necessarily feel um, that mild and uh, what goes up 
must come down. So then it's behind that front we get into the colder air that comes in there for that period. All right, so what's happening as that front approaches, we should start off, uh, especially western parts of the GTA and around the Golden Horseshoe and back towards uh, the Windsor area with sunshine. But I expect into the GTA, even in the morning hours, some sun. Clouds will be building, though, as we go towards tomorrow afternoon as we play this forward. And it's also in the afternoon, as that front approaches, we get into the slurry activity along it. And the wind's blowing it around, so it can have an impact a bit on visibility, even though it's not heavy snow. Where there will be heavier snow is behind this, when the wind's set up and we get into some of these squalls here off of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. But really, it's just flurries that make their way into the GTA for Friday. So much colder air, but there'll be some sun in there, too. Uh, so there's that trade-off once again. Snowfall potential, the amounts. This is just looking at for tonight with the winds that we've been seeing out of the west overnight tonight into tomorrow morning and you have that risk there uh, around Perry Sound through that area Huntsville that we could be looking at 10 15 centimeters or locally even more tonight here it is southwestern Ontario minus 10 other than London feeling like minus 17 tonight for Toronto minus 10 feeling almost like minus 18 with the wind factor there. And then tomorrow, the bounce up and then the drop down. Just looking at those numbers there. And then the rebound again comes our way. So it's not going to last too long, Kelda. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Colette. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Maribel Tarouk has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. I will see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night, everyone.